Psalm 41. Psalm 41. Let's hear the word of God. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. As for me, I said, Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me. But you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and Amen. Praise God for his word. May he give us understanding. Speak to us today. Now you may be thinking, what a strange reading for a day when we have a dedication service. But actually in this passage, which is the next psalm in our series on the psalms, this passage gives us principles for a God-centered life. And we have prayed for young Camilla and we want her to have a God-centered life. And a God-centered life is reflected in our attitude to those in need because God cares for the poor and the weak. So, in Psalm 14 and verse 6, which is speaking about the ways of the world, as that psalm starts, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. It then goes on to say about the world around, it says, you would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. So, a God-centered life includes many things, but one aspect of that is care for those around you because your life has been touched by the love of God who loves the poor and the needy. But also the principles that flow out of that is if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, he will take care of you. And that's what the rest of verses 1 to 3 talk about. The Lord will deliver him in the day of trouble. But then, you come to the next section from verse 4 to 10, and you find suddenly that the, the psalmist, King David, is in a mess. He's saying, well, I'm a sinner for a start, verse 4. And then he goes on to talk about his enemies and the trouble he's facing. So we have principles for life in verses 1 to 3, but then in the next part, we have perplexities, or things that confuse us. Even though we know God cares for us, things don't always happen as we think they should. We face trouble. 
And the final couple of verses resolve themselves in the purpose of God for life. The very last line of verse 12 says this, you will set me in your presence forever. That's the destination. That's why we have prayed for Diego and Isabel and their family, that each one of those girls would come to trust the Lord Jesus Christ so they will have that assurance that they will be set forever in the presence of the Lord. But also, this psalm is helpful to everyone here because it points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then if you notice verse 9, even my close friend whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And you remember that when you get to the Gospels, you meet a man called Judas, to whom Jesus gives a piece of bread. And Judas becomes the betrayer. And so, while we trust the Lord, we face perplexities, problems. We know that we have that final destination in his presence. But our precious Saviour has walked the road before us. We do not walk the road of life alone. Jesus walks with us by his Spirit. We're told in Colossians chapter 1, that you, if you are a Christian, have Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Christ who knows betrayal, who knows suffering and death, is the saviour of all who believe. But let's look first briefly at this principle. Principle for life, or principles for life, that we see in verse 1. Notice the first word there, blessed. If you were around back in 2020 when we first started looking uh, at the book of Psalms, the very first word of the book of Psalms is this same word, blessed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or sits in the seat of sinners, nor, sorry, stands in the, with the sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful. And this psalm is again pointing. And Psalm 1 gave two ways. The way of blessing and the way of wickedness. The way of the path and the future being secure and the path and future being un lost. Two ways. And this psalm has come back to that now. So we see the blessed way. Psalm 1 spoke of loving the law of the Lord and meditating on his law day and night and flourishing in faith and fruitfulness because you know the Lord. This psalm focuses on one aspect of that, which is a concern for those around you. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. It's almost like a, a Jesus himself picks up on this in his, his Beatitudes in Matthew 5, where he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That's the same idea as contained here in this psalm. Now, in one sense, this refers to David's role as king. When you go to the, to the Old Testament and you see the commands given to those who are rulers. So, for example, in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 14. Proverbs 29 and verse 14, it says, if a king faithfully judges the poor, his throne will be established forever. Again, a principle of those who have authority over us to care for the poor and needy. The same was said of Solomon in Psalm 72 about his care for the poor. But the king in Israel was a pointer to the ultimate ruler himself, the Lord God Almighty. So in Psalm 
113 and verse 7, we read about the Lord God Almighty. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. And so King David is saying, all rulers like me who's writing this psalm must be those who care for the poor. But then we know from the, 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 the psalms point us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the one who cared for the poor. He is the one who met with the needy. He is the one who healed the sick. He is the one who taught the truth. He is the one who welcomed everybody who would come to him who recognized their need. Not simply a material need or a physical need, but the greatest need of all, a spiritual need for forgiveness of sins for salvation. So this verse points us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also represents to us a principle for our own lives. If you love Jesus, you will love the people he loves. So if Jesus reaches out to the weak and frail and needy, both physically and above all spiritually, so should a believer. Now, loving the poor, caring for the needy doesn't save a person. You, a person is saved through faith in Jesus Christ. But remember back in our studies in Luke, in Luke chapter 3, and when the people came out to John the Baptist, and they said, what shall we do? One of the things that he said to them was, if you've got two tunics, two cloaks, give one away. And the principle there is if your heart has been touched by the love of God, then you do not any longer need to primarily be thinking of me, myself, my needs, my safety, my security, because you've been touched by the love of God, you have a, a freedom of self-forgetfulness and a freedom to be generous with your time and your finances, your service. Notice there it says, blessed is the one who considers the poor. This isn't simply dropping a coin in someone's cup that you see on the street begging for money. It's considering. It's thinking through how we can help. It's not when there's a needy person in the church, be it spiritually, emotionally, materially, just a quick text to say, oh, I'm praying for you. Actually think about how we can help each other, how we can help the needy. A life touched by the Lord is transformed to touch the lives of others following in the footsteps of our Saviour. And then, remember that, that beatitude of Jesus, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That's Matthew 5, verse 7. The rest of this section of the psalm then unpacks a series of principles for God's care. And there's actually seven of them. Let me highlight them for you. Verse 1. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. So deliverance, verse 1. Verse 2, the Lord protects and keeps him alive. And also verse 2, he is called blessed in the land. That's four so far. Next line of verse 2, you do not give him up the will of his enemies. Verse 3, the Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In the second line of verse 3, in his illness, you restore him to full health. And notice, each of those lines, apart from the one about being blessed in the land, each of those lines either uses the name of the Lord or the word you. In other words, all of them are talking about the care protection, provision, 
strengthening comfort of the living God that is personal. He will do these things. It doesn't say, I'll send an angel to do them for me. It says the Lord will do these things. If you are a Christian, you are under the personal care of Almighty God. The Lord is my rock and my redeemer. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my strength and my shield. This is personal. The Lord, even as was prayed earlier, Jesus is my saviour. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. This is the personal love and care of Almighty God. Principles for life. But secondly, perplexities. Perplexities means things that confuse us, but perplexity begins with P. And I like to have all the titles begin with the same letter. Things that confuse us. There's a change in, in, in scenery in, from verse 4 onwards. David's beginning to say, well, Lord, firstly, I'm a sinner. I need to be forgiven. But verse 5 begins to talk about enemies and trouble and then people visiting him falsely. What is this telling us? What's happened between verse 3 where he's confident, and verse 4, when he's confused. Well, it's the reality of life on this earth. I think it's important that we grasp this. Because as human beings, I know for me, I like everything to be logical and orderly. And I read the promises of God, things that speak about peace and provision, protection, even our enemies being at peace with us, and all those things that we see in the Bible. But sometimes when it comes to troubles that we face and burdens that we carry and fears that we experience, it seems like the promises aren't working. It's, and we get confused. Sometimes we, we kind of think, well, is God really there? We get discouraged. And then maybe uh, uh, we, 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 we stop reading the Bible each day. And we, we don't pray quite so much. And then we, don't, we stop coming on a Sunday. And we stop coming to prayer. Because we're confused. And that confusion begins to kind of infect our faith. So we become discouraged. And David here wants, is, is giving us some pointers to help us in the midst of confusion. I think one thing is very important to, to understand here is that not every verse of Scripture is a promise. There are lots of principles that give us, a, like Proverbs, for example, is full of principles which are general direction to the way God has made the universe but sometimes there are exceptions. Sometimes there are troubles that we go through that we can't explain. Another thing that, 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 that David shows us here is in the midst of those, those troubles and things that confuse us, God remains the same. Notice that David doesn't stop praying when he's confused. He's continuing through this psalm, bringing his burdens to the Lord. Another thing I think that, that, that David recognizes here is that actually, even though God is always good and he never fails, we do fail. Look again at verse 4. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me, heal me, for I have sinned against you. And that little two words, heal me, means literally, cure my soul. What a way to think of it. Cure my soul. That my innermost being is corrupted by sin. I think wrong. I say wrong. I, I feel wrong. I, I want things that are not good for me. I want my own way. 
I want to rewrite God's, God's rules to fit my worldview, my view of how life should be. Inwardly, I am corrupted. And he's saying, cure me. Cure me on the inside. For I have sinned against you. And notice, against you. It's not just that we sin against other people. We do that. But every sin is against the Lord. Remember later on in Psalm 51, David says this, against you, you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight. So David is recognizing that some of those perplexities are actually down to the fact that we get things wrong. And we, go, we, we do things and there are consequences to that that affect us. And also the Lord in his love for us and grace to us takes us through times of trouble so that we see the need for the cure in our soul. Troubles, if you like, are God's MRI scan for our souls. You know you've got those things and you don't really see them until you go through that scanner. Troubles bring out what's in our souls. He's still caring for us. He's still sustaining. He's still protecting. But he, in his love, taking us through those times of trouble. I think it's also important to recognize that we live in a fallen world. So the reason that there is trouble in our life is because we actually live in a world that is broken. Surrounded by people who are broken and people who are sinners. And David particularly is feeling that right now in this psalm. Notice in verse 5, he, he's, he's saying to them, look, my, my, he's saying to God, my enemies are wishing me dead. And then in verse 6, he says, there's people coming to visit me, but they're saying nice things to my face, but actually in their heart is evil. And then when they go out, they're going around and telling everybody, oh, well, he's not going to last long. At David, he's going he's to be gone, gone soon, so we'll get a new king. That's what he's saying. They're going out and spreading abroad, spreading around lies. And then in verse 7, all who hate me whisper together about me. So there's plotting against him. And then in verse 8, he's saying there's a, a dead, they say a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. They're saying he's going to die. And then in verse 9, we have that reference that we see later to the Lord Jesus, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But if you read 2 Samuel chapter 5, you find, sorry, 2 Samuel 15, you find that David's close friend and advisor turned against him and supported his son who was rebelling and trying to overthrow him. David went through great, great trouble. But so do we. Our list from verse 5 onwards might not be the same as David's. You might not be sick and having sick visitors who then turn against you outside of the room. But we do all face trouble. And we do face behind the trouble. There's often the enemy who hates us and people who hate the gospel. And there are places around the world where trouble is far worse than it is here because a whole government and culture wants to destroy the Christian church. David is being honest and real about these things. And when we're confused in times of trouble, we need to bring our confusion and the things that confuse us to the Lord. Let's not pretend, let's be real before him. But of course we also see in our Lord Jesus Christ. He will never need to pray, verse 4, because he is sinless. As we've seen in these series of Psalms from 38 through to this one, 
They're psalms which point us to Jesus, who, he's not a sinner, but he came to represent sinners. And so because of Jesus, who carried our sin on the cross, we can say with verse, verse 4, O oh Lord, be gracious to me, heal me, for I have sinned against you. And he carried our sins and suffered in our place for them. And the kind of language we see in these verses, verses 5 to 9, that we see them in the life of Jesus. We see the Pharisees plotting against him. We see people whispering against him. We see people, when he, when he was hanging on the cross, were basically saying, well, it's your fault, you're there, God is judging you. And if God really loves you, come down from the cross, show yourself. The mocking and the malice. And then, of course, we see Judas in John chapter 13. And John 13, that quotes verse 9, gives us a little extra thing. That Judas was so positioned at the table of the Last Supper that he was placed at the position of trust. The fact that he and Jesus could dip their bread in the same bit of, of water, or wine rather, where it was, it was uh, given, Jude, David, dip, Jesus dipped the bread and gave it to Judas. The fact that he could do that tells us that Judas was at the place of trust. And this is what Jesus experienced. And you know, sometimes, just let me apply this briefly to ourselves. Sometimes, you have been some of you have been betrayed. Someone's turned against you and, and hurt you. Someone that you trusted. Maybe a spouse or a, a good friend, maybe even a child or a parent. Here you have a saviour who understands. The Christian faith is not a religion of external conformity to a list of rules. It's relationship with the living God through a living Savior by the Holy Spirit, knowing a Savior who has walked our path of suffering ahead of us. One who comforts, encourages, draws alongside, and strengthens us. But notice almost the irony of verse 8. They say a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from, when he, from where he lies. Well, what happened on the third day after Jesus was nailed to the cross? He rose again from where he lay. The enemy maybe thought, it's done, it's finished, I've dealt with Jesus, I've got rid of him, and through the cross, he's the sin is paid for, and then through the resurrection, death is defeated. And you know, if you're a Christian, at your funeral, be it a cremation or a burial, to all earthly eyes, you will lie in that grave or in that urn and until it all disintegrates and then no more to be. But actually, if you are a Christian, on that resurrection day, you will hear the voice of Jesus and you will rise again. What encouragement, what comfort that is to us. And we see also... A warning in verse 10. We struggle, don't we, with some of these phrases in the psalm that speak about judgment, raise me up, it says that I may repay them. But we need to understand that this is not a personal vendetta. That's sin. Personal vendetta is sin. But as the king of Israel, David had to execute justice. That's what he's praying for, that I'd recover again, that I could execute justice. But it also comes with a warning to all of us concerning the Lord Jesus. Because that same passage where Jesus speaks about the dead hearing his voice, he speaks about those being raised to life and those being raised to condemnation. 
that the Saviour who's walked our road, who has suffered and died for our sins, he invites us to come to know him and to trust him and be forgiven of our sins. But if we don't, the day will come when we will be repaid for our sins. Me to hear that warning. If you're not a Christian, please put your trust in Jesus Christ today, turning from your sin. Believe he died and rose for you. Turn around. Stop following your way. And follow him in faith and submission to his loving lordship as your saviour. And that brings us on to the final section of this psalm. So we've seen principles, perplexities, thirdly, purpose. The purpose, ultimately, of our lives is found in verse 12. You have upheld me because of my integrity. That doesn't mean my perfection. It means a sincerity of heart because you're a believer. He's upheld you and he will set you in his presence forever. That's the purpose of life. The purpose of life is not to build a big earthly home and have great riches and be healthy for all your days. God blesses you with those things. They are good and you need to thank him for them. And remember verse 1, be generous with it all. Give it away. But the ultimate purpose is we are going to be with him. He's been made as his image bearers to be with him. And you think about back there in the Garden of Eden, God made Adam from the clay, from the dust of the earth, and then he breathed into him the breath of life. And even in that very act of breathing life into Adam is a sign to us that our purpose in, in living on earth and forever in glory is to be face to face with God. At the point of Adam's coming into being, he was face to face with the living God. And that's what we've been made for. We're not meant to be simply roaming around in the dirt of life forever. We are made, created for fellowship with the living God that we have in part here. We have those that, that, that care of the Lord we speak about in verses 1 to 3. We have the ability to go to him with our burdens and our fears and our concerns, our list of troubles that David did in verses 5 to 9. We confess our sins to him. We ask him that, that finally there are days coming when there'll be vindication and the world will see that we know him. We can be confident that verse 11, he delights in us because of Christ. We can be assured that even though the enemy on earth shouts very loudly and we get deeply discouraged, that ultimately the promises of verse 1 to 3 will be fulfilled, that we will be forever in the care face to face with the living God. So this psalm once again, like Psalm 1, presents two ways. Are you going to be among those that say of King Jesus, no, I wish he was dead. I wish he wasn't here. I wish there was no such thing as Jesus. I don't believe he exists anyway. It's all pointless. Because the perplexities of life are only resolved in knowing Jesus Christ. Because only then do they, we see they have purpose. Only then do we as sinners, no forgiveness of sins. Only then can we have that hope of eternal life and not face a prospect of separation from God's love forever. We need to follow the way of Jesus. But if you are a Christian, I'm sure you recognize there are perplexities in life. 
Let's do what David did. Rest in confidence in who God is. Recognize our greatest need. Tell him our own list of troubles. Remember that Jesus has walked our way and focus on the destination. No wonder this psalm concludes with verse 13. In fact, verse 13 is actually not part of Psalm 41. It's actually the final verse that ends the first book of Psalm. If you've got a, a physical Bible in front of you, you will find that right under verse 13 it says book 2. So verse 13 is actually the end of this whole series of Psalms. And because the whole series from Psalm 3 to Psalm 41 is mainly reflecting on the troubles and trials and sufferings of God's promised king, King David, pointing us to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. The psalmist can end this section by saying, God, you're still good. God, you've brought David through these troubles. God, you're going to bring your eternal son through these troubles on earth to victory. And so we say with the psalmist, blessed be or praise be to Yahweh. Praise be to the eternal, unchanging, covenant-keeping God who is my God, my King and ruler from everlasting to everlasting. That's good news. That means eternity. That also means the next generation, Camilla and the other little ones in this church, they grow to praise the Lord. And the final two words of this book, part of the book of Psalms, is Amen and Amen. Which means it's true. So be it. It's trustworthy. It's certain. We say our men at the end of a prayer and say, so be it, but also an affirmation of the truth. So he's saying, yes, he is a blessed, praiseworthy God forever and ever and ever. So, we give thanks for his salvation. We commit ourselves to, yes, Lord, I will serve you with the attitude that you have towards us. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. Yes, I will trust you, because of all those things you say about yourself in those verses, delivering from trouble, protecting, and keeping alive and being blessed, and not giving up to the will of the enemy. You sustain us on our sickbed. You restore us. This is what you're like. But Lord, I understand in a fallen world and in my own sin, there's perplexities and problems and trials. But I know, Lord God, that I can bring them to you and ultimately they'll all be resolved because I'll be in your presence forever. And so however hard it gets, Lord, I'm going to praise you. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Father, just please speak your truth afresh to everyone here today. You know whether there are some here who the first time need to take that step of trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Please help them to do that. You know if there are those here who perhaps have become confused and have grown cold and wandered away who need to return to you. You know those of us who could read this psalm and say, well, my problems aren't quite the same as David, but I'm really struggling with them, and they're still confusing me. Help us to bring each of those troubles to you in confidence. And keep our eyes upon our Lord Jesus Christ and our eyes upon the prize. Forever with the Lord. Blessed be the Lord, the God not just of old covenant Israel, but the new Israel, the church. The blessed be the Lord, the God of Lansdowne, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen.
and amen. The Lord bless you.